The COVID-19 pandemic brought to light many deficiencies in health systems across the world. Even as it continues, discussions are on for a pandemic treaty that would address some of the pressing concerns that face the health systems of the world, specifically on the issues of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response or PPR. However, it's impossible to address these issues without talking about financing and the current models that are deeply skewed against developing and poor countries. It is in this context that Geneva Global Health Hub, G2H2, a platform of over 40 civil society organizations, released a report titled Financial Justice for Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response. Nicoletta Dentico, G2H2 co-chair and report co-author, talks about some of these issues. Well, the, the report uh, is basically stemming uh, by stemming from uh, uh, Geneva Global Health Hub's recognition that uh, COVID-19 has brought uh, a new set of uh, categories, uh, uh, a new set of approaches, uh, a new set of uh, ideas and notions that we need to really take into consideration when we talk about global health. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the whole concept itself of global health uh, needs to be profoundly questioned as it has been uh, interpreted by the mainstream uh, uh, actors of, of global health. Uh, they have made it become a sort of a doctrine divided by diseases. So uh, the idea is also to start reshaping this notion into perhaps uh, global health justice or global public health. So it, it's in this kind of uh, uh, collective thinking that uh, the idea to look at financing for health uh, in the context of the pandemic treaty negotiation seemed extremely relevant because whatever the outcome of these uh, uh, negotiations ongoing at the WHO, be it the pandemic treaty itself or the review of the international health regulations, financing will be a pillar, will be an indispensable element of whatever scenario the WHO and the international community are going to build. And we also wanted to challenge this notion of building back better, because the idea is that we needed to build forward better. The back was the problem. And therefore, uh, the idea of uh, looking at finance uh, for health, for us, is a kind of an indicator of uh, uh, the honesty and the truthfulness of the international community on the one hand, and uh, the sense of direction that they want to take, meaning, do uh, governments uh, uh, or the international community or the WHO itself want to use this rhetoric basically to have a new stage, a new phase of the business as usual? This was the kind of uh, initial inspirational uh, light that, that gave us uh, this, this idea that we needed to bring at this point, at this conjuncture, those unspoken topics that uh, uh, have been a kind of a taboo even when talking about financing, because uh, talking about financing at the WHO has been mostly talking about innovative financing mechanisms, always looking at the expenditure side of uh, health budgets and hardly at the revenue side of health budgets. So this is what we actually uh, have decided to challenge a bit, looking at the financial violence that exists in the world and the initial signs that we see with this pandemic fund venued at the World Bank that doesn't seem to be promising at all to us, both because it is venued at the World Bank that actually has a policy since 2013 of uh, leveraging the private sector, and also because uh, this pandemic fund, uh, it's a kind of an iteration of an old model that was uh, specifically focused on specific diseases, like the Global Fund for AIDS, and TB, and malaria, but which will never really serve for pandemic pre prevention, preparedness, and response. And that is the first critique that this report highlights. A key focus area of this report has been the impact of austerity policies and commercialization. Throughout the pandemic, health workers went on strike across the world, protesting the destruction of systems that would have helped them combat COVID-19 better. Due to pressure from bodies such as the IMF and the World Bank, Countries over the past few decades have considerably cut spending on public health and associated fields. A lot of the sector has been privatized. Why are these trends dangerous for the health sector? 
the problem of uh, austerity uh, and uh, uh, all that austerity brings, which is privatization, it is commercialization, marketization of health, is in itself one of those structural pathologies that has uh, actually done so much harm to health rights and that have actually killed so many peoples, so many million peoples in the world, and also, you know, uh, basically broken life's desires, life's aspirations, uh, life's projects for uh, many communities in the world. Uh, the, the report uh, uh, gives a, a bit of a political economy of this because, you know, our feeling is that many decision makers, but also civil society actors, act in a kind of constant presence. They don't have any sense of perspective, neither for where we come from and why we are here today. And therefore, they have a, also a very restricted, very limited projection for a different future. So what we see, and we are very concerned as G2H2, is the development also of a civil society, uh, the civil society working on global health that now claims that they want to be at the seat, at the table in negotiating a treaty as if a treaty making were a kind of a new PPP, new public and private partnerships where civil society has to be there. And, uh, um, who are really uh, with, you know, working within the given context. And they try to only exclusively do damage control of the poor solutions that the international financial institutions or the G20 are providing to uh, consider finance. No one is ever talking about the fact that austerity measures are not only a terrible legacy of the last uh, 40 years, uh, <clears throat> They, of course, started with the developing world uh, uh, in the late 70s and the 80s uh, primarily. But then there, there was a kind of a third worldization, a third worldization of the whole uh, globe, for, for, a bet, for a lack of a better word to, to actually mention it, uh, that came over with the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, where also the northern countries uh, started to learn the harsh lesson of austerity measures, which is a, con a, a, a real a, a, con a reduction, a, a very serious, extreme reduction of public spending uh, and a, a very uh, net cut of all the social expenditures that are those that actually make a society and that allow a society to live, but which also allow a, a kind of a healthy relationship between governments and its own people. Uh, so these measures, which uh, have the, developed themselves in so many venues, uh, not only with financial cuts, but also then with the emergence, the mushrooming of so many, <clears throat> uh, so many uh, modalities of uh, uh, a booming healthcare industry that has taken over in uh, most countries uh, to compensate for gaps in health. Uh, and of course, uh, the marketization of health, which is uh, enhancing uh, uh, seriously health uh, inequalities in this world. And as I said, this is, of course, a, a phenomenon that has different ways of expressing itself, uh, different modalities of manifesting itself, but it is a global phenomenon. It happens everywhere. Inequalities in health are occurring everywhere. Uh, th this is something that is happening and in, it, it's, it's a recipe that it has been uh, administered, it has been administered during COVID and as uh, the IMF projections and uh, Isabel Ortiz, who was uh, one of the respondents at the launch of our report, uh, told us very clearly, this is something that uh, by 2020, uh, 2023 is going to hit 148 countries, which is about 6.7 billion people cutting on health and uh, reducing the possibility for health rights to be met, to be, uh, uh, to be satisfied. This is not a destiny. This is a situation that can be avoided and it must be avoided. So the report uh, has uh, quite a number of pages dedicated precisely to this uh, terrible pathology of, uh, uh, of austerity measures, conditionalities, cuts, privatizations, uh, uh, policies, and for example, the 
public and private partnerships, which the IMF and the World Bank occasionally recognize they don't work. You know, they, they have said in several occasions that these policies have actually done harm to health, but like, uh, uh, like men who beat up their women, uh, and occasionally they admit they had, uh, you know, have, have had a faulty behavior, then they continue beating up their women. And IMF is continuously then, uh, uh, in a way, suggesting that these policies are to be implemented. The World Bank does exactly the same, even if they claim that they want to abandon them. So this is something that we are experiencing now. And this is really a pandemic that we need to prevent and to respond to very clearly. A deep structural question is one of debt and illicit financial flows. If the debt of the 76 most indebted countries had been waived in 2020, US dollars 40 billion would have been available for pandemic response. How have these factors affected the response to the pandemic and the health sector at large? This report uh, uh, has uh, also another uh, inner <laughs> objective which uh, uh, is to have different communities uh, of uh, commitment, of engagement, talk to each other. We belong to the global health community and we have dealt uh, with the finance. Uh, certainly the PHM has done this uh, in previous uh, reports and activities, but uh, we definitely need uh, to uh, link up much more to the uh, financial crowd, to the financial community constituency uh, with those uh, civil society entities that are working on uh, uh, the various manifestations of uh, the dysfunctional financial architecture and uh, to unite forces uh, and unite uh, uh, voices in the calls that they are making for curbing illicit financial flows, uh, cancelling the debt, uh, transforming, reforming uh, the taxation system and bring financial justice. So the report also had uh, this idea of uh, um, using health as a very important lens, as a, as a crucial lens to uh, give uh, uh, additional evidence of the uh, wrongdoing of these policies and uh, the need, the urgent need to uh, to reform, actually to um, transform, I'd rather say, the financial architecture as we have it today. So yes, debt. Uh, debt of uh, poor countries, of uh, uh, low-income countries, uh, middle and low-income countries, but also debt of uh, countries in the north. The report, uh, when talking about uh, debt cancellation, brings a, a, quotation, a quote from a, a recent research of the London School of Economics, which actually suggests debt cancellation also in the UK for... Uh, for solving a, a dire problem of the fact that one out of four households cannot have enough money for their essential expenditures by the end of the month. So there is an increasing poverty that needs to be tackled in the UK and that cancellation could be the, re, the, the radical uh, idea for uh, re-establishing a new circulation of, of money and a new liberation of potential financial resources that are now kind of uh, kept in the hands of the few. Because we need, to, we need to remember that the world is awash in money. <laughs> the, the, the narrative about the scarcity of funding is really a fake news. And that cancellation is for us a, a, a way to also redefine uh, a narrative uh, when it comes to financial justice, but also an overall issue that uh, uh, should uh, redesign the relationship between the, the North and the South. Uh, of course, uh, that there was already a thriving debt crisis before COVID arrived. Uh, there was a very, this is what the World Bank and the IMF are saying. Uh, the World Bank uh, released a report uh, in uh, 2020, in January 2020, already sending the alarm about a global debt crisis. Mm -hmm. This has become only worse after COVID-19, which uh, uh, the pathogen arrived at already rather difficult time for indebted countries. And the, the last uh, uh, annual meetings of the World Bank uh, 
uh, actually outlined the, the peril of this bomb exploding anytime, okay? So we needed to look at the debt issue and we needed to, look, to look at the new ways to address debt, which is not just uh, you know, procrastinating on or, or postponing uh, the payment of debt service, which is more or less what the G20 proposes, but it is really a major restructuring. And now we are proposing that countries from the South should stop paying this debt. Because if we look at things really, it is the North having a major substantive ecological debt towards the countries of the South. The global South is paying the highest price for the climate change and the global warming, but it is actually, as the Lancet Planetary Health uh, uh, disclosed in a very recent article, the, U the US and Europe that that account for more than 50% of all the gas emissions and the devastation that has been produced uh, and, and that we are confronted with today. Another report that says uh, that came out in 2022 says that it is in fact uh, the North that has to pay a colossal reparation to the South. So whose debt are we talking about? And we need to tackle this issue even when we are discussing about health because uh, health, uh, is the first victim of debt services and debt payment. If uh, the 76 most indebted countries had been able to uh, be exempted from debt payment in 2020, this, I mean, this cancellation of their debt in just one year would have liberated $40 billion. It would have been $300 billion if the debt cancellation had included also 2022, 2021, sorry, when uh, uh, countries in the global south, just as much as in the global north, were still in the midst of the COVID crisis, except that the north had the vaccines, the south didn't. So these are some of the issues that we need to bring on the table when negotiating a pandemic treaty. It's not that because the WHO cannot deal with uh, the financial architecture, that we cannot bring these issues also in a negotiation about uh, uh, the, the future of uh, the pandemic uh, prevention, preparedness, and response.